Welcome back to Dirty Medicine's Dirty Biochemistry series. This video is on the disorders of galactose metabolism. If I can pause for a second and just lay out kind of how we're going to go through this video, we're going to start by outlining the normal biochemistry. So I'm going to give you the pathway about how we start with lactose and convert it into different sugars and work our way through the pathway of galactose metabolism. Along the way, I'll show you what three diseases will manifest if we knock out certain enzymes. That is to say, if we have certain enzymatic deficiencies. As I go through these diseases, I'll give you my awesome dirty medicine mnemonics to help you remember the high yield findings that you'll be asked to know on test day when you sit for USMLE or Comlex. So let's begin by talking about lactose, which is our starting material. Lactose can be converted into both glucose and galactose. The enzyme that converts lactose into galactose is lactase. Another way of saying this is that the enzyme lactase breaks down lactose. Now think about the name. You've probably heard about lactose intolerance before, and you're also probably aware that this is due to a problem with the lactase enzyme. But if you look at the name lactase, it's telling you that it's acing or breaking down lact or lactose. So that's where the name comes from. So again, lactose is converted into galactose by lactase. Now everything you see here shown in the gray box is occurring at the brush border of the small intestine. We'll come back at the end of this video and talk about lactose intolerance because of the three diseases of galactose metabolism, it's the lowest yield. Next, galactose can be converted also into one of two different products. One is galactose 1-phosphate, and the other is galactitol. Now you need to know both of the enzymes that convert galactose into these two different products. The enzyme that converts galactose into galactitol is aldose reductase. The enzyme that converts galactose into galactose 1-phosphate is galactokinase. Now, just as an aside, sort of a big picture, high yield way of remembering some biochemistry, whenever you see an enzyme that ends in kinase, it means it's just putting a phosphate group on whatever the reactant is. So in this case, you start with galactose and it gets a phosphate in the one position. And that's why the enzyme is galactokinase because it's kinasing or sticking a phosphate on galactose. This also helps explain why the product is galactose 1-phosphate because it has one phosphate stuck onto it by galactokinase. So keep that in mind if you're ever struggling with enzyme names reactants, and products. Now, galactose 1-phosphate can be converted into glucose 1-phosphate by the enzyme galactokinase 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. In this step, you need UDP glucose to be converted into UDP galactose as a cofactor. Now, this step is extremely, extremely important to understand, and it's very high yield. We'll talk about it in a little bit about knocking out this enzyme and what disease you get if that happens. Now, once you have glucose 1-phosphate, you should be a little bit familiar with this product. Glucose 1-phosphate has a lot of downstream options. It can enter glycolysis, it can enter glycogenesis, it can be used in a, ver in a variety of biochemical pathways. So keeping with our theme that we've seen throughout the Dirty Biochemistry series, different reactions are generating different products which can be used by other biochemical pathways. So this is the main pathway of galactose metabolism, and you need to know the enzymes shown in red. You also need to know the cofactor shown in green. Now let's talk about what happens if you have certain enzyme deficiencies. The first disease that we'll talk about is what you get if you knock out galactokinase. So shown in this large blue X, we have an enzyme deficiency of galactokinase. Now think about this by looking at our pathway. If you don't have galactokinase, then you cannot convert galactose into galactose 1-phosphate, so you can't do the blue dotted line. Instead, this will be shunted to the blue thick line, so galactose will be converted into galactitol by aldose reductase. So by simply knocking out galactokinase, we have a preference to divert galactose into galactitol. This disease is aptly named a galactokinase deficiency. So again, what do you have here? You have a decrease of the enzyme galactokinase. You have a decrease of the product galactokinase 1-phosphate because you cannot convert the reactant into the product. 
Instead, you have an increase of galactitol because the pathway gets shunted in preference of converting galactokinase into galactitol. So these are the findings that you need to be familiar with for a galactokinase deficiency. But there are a lot of clinical findings and other high yield features that you could be required to know on USMLE or Comlex. And that's what we're going to talk about now. The other things that you should know about a galactokinase deficiency are that you'll see galactosemia, which means galactose in the blood, right? Emia means blood. So galactose, emia, galactose in the blood. Galactose urea, which urea means urine. So galactose in the urine. So galactose in the blood and the urine because we have a lot of galactose that's accumulating since we cannot use galactokinase. You'll have abnormal eye tracking. I'll come back to this in just a second, but you're going to see a lot of visual difficulties when you have an accumulation of galactitol. Lack of the development of a social smile. This is an autosomal recessive disease. And you'll see infantile cataracts. Now, overall, galactokinase deficiency is really not a severe disease. So you see infantile cataracts that aren't that bad. And you see abnormal eye tracking. When you have an accumulation of a substance like galactitol, that substance actually gets trapped in the lens of the eye. And when that happens, you get the cataracts and you get abnormal eye tracking. So how do you remember all of these high yield findings? Well, you should remember this by remembering galactokinase deficiency, G-A-L-A-C. G for galactosemia and galactosuria because that, galac that galactose is accumulating in the blood and accumulating in the urine. A for abnormal eye tracking because there's an increase in galactitol, which is being trapped in the eye. L for lack of a social smile during development, A for autosomal recessive disease, and C for infantile cataracts, or just cataracts. So that's galactokinase deficiency, and it's really not as bad as the next disease that we're going to talk about. So again, this is a galactokinase deficiency when you knock out galactokinase. Now let's talk about the more severe form of a galactokinase problem. And that's if we actually knock out the next enzyme in the pathway, we knock out galactokinase 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. So this is a really severe disease, much more severe than the galactokinase deficiency. And the reason is that because this enzyme is processing a lot more of the galactose load in the body. So if you knock this one out, the symptoms are gonna be way more severe and you're gonna get a greater accumulation of products in the body. And it's that accumulation of products that isn't normally there that causes all of the symptoms. So look at our pathway. If we knock out galactokinase 1-phosphate uridyl transferase, then we can't do the two blue dotted lines. We cannot convert galactose 1-phosphate into its next product. And we can't really convert galactose into galactose 1-phosphate because without this enzyme, Galactose 1-phosphate is going to build up and there's going to be negative feedback that's going to tell galactokinase not to convert galactose into galactose 1-phosphate. So again, just like in the galactokinase deficiency, with a galactokinase 1-phosphate uridyl transferase deficiency, there's going to be a preference to shunt the galactose into galactitol. So here are our findings, and this disease is referred to as classic galactosemia. So the pathophysiology here is that we have a deficiency of galactokinase 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. And because of this, we have an increase in galactitol, just like we did in our previous disease, and an increase in galactose. The only difference here is that these are accumulating in much higher volumes, and we're going to get much more severe symptoms. So let's talk about the high-yield symptoms and associated findings that you should absolutely know for USMLE and Comlex. You get really severe cataracts. You get liver enlargement, so hepatomegaly. Again, this is also autosomal recessive. You're very susceptible to sepsis, and specifically E. coli sepsis in, in infancy. This classically will occur when the infant starts feeding, right? So initially, if you start giving them milk and they develop vomiting, diarrhea, nausea, crying after they're fed initially, this is where this classically presents. So it's going to be when the infant starts feeding. You're going to see an intellectual disability and you're going to see the color of their skin change. So they're going to get jaundiced. So how do you remember all this stuff, right? It's a lot of information. I totally get it. But dirty medicine has your back. Just remember classic galactosemia. C for cataracts, L for liver enlargement, A for autosomal recessive, 
S for sepsis, S for start of feeding, so when the infant begins getting milk early in life, I for intellectual disability, and C for color changes, aka jaundice. So the first disease was a galactokinase deficiency, and this disease is classic galactosemia. So the difference is in the name, and the dirty medicine mnemonic is to simply use the name of the disease to help you recall the high yield findings. So really simply guys, because the body can't process the galactose, the treatment is to just not give them galactose or lactose in their diet. Now remember that galactose comes from lactose, so you don't wanna give them the upstream reactant. You don't wanna give them the lactose, you also don't wanna give them galactose. Okay, so that's classic galactosemia. Very, very high yield associated findings. Know about all of these features. The last of these three diseases that we're going to talk about in this lecture is actually lactose intolerance. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard about lactose intolerance because it's very common in multiple cultures across the world. So really briefly, just for completeness sake, I'll discuss it here, but know that of these three diseases, it's the lowest yield. Lactose intolerance, your findings are gonna be increased H2 in the breath, increased CH4, and increased organic acids. You're obviously gonna get the symptoms of bloating, gassiness, some diarrhea, and you're gonna see a decrease in the pH of the stool. So know these findings, but don't overly commit this to memory. Like this is definitely important to know, but if you're struggling for brain space, know the first two diseases that we talked about. There are two types of lactose intolerance. One is the primary type. So this is basically age determinant. So everybody in their life reaches a certain age where the ability of our intestines to process lactose simply is not what it was at birth. The prevailing theory here is that we evolved as humans to need breast milk when we're born. And when we reach a certain age, we obviously don't need to be breastfed anymore. So the intestines would evolve over time to not be able to process milk because evolutionarily speaking, you don't need milk after a certain age. So that's what's responsible for the primary type of lactose intolerance. And this is classically seen in African Americans, Asians, and even some Native Americans. The secondary type of lactose intolerance and the most high yield part of this slide that you should definitely know is the post-viral lactose intolerance. So if you get some type of gastroenteritis and you knock out the intestinal brush border because of this inflammation or some type of autoimmune process, anything that can damage the intestinal brush border can cause an acquired lactose intolerance. Because if you damage that intestinal brush border, then you cannot process lactose. Because again, the intestinal brush border is the site where lactose gets processed by lactase. So know the primary type, which depends on your age, but know the secondary type, especially, this is really high yield, after a really bad gastroenteritis, you could develop the symptoms of lactose intolerance. Last really high yield point that I need to include about lactose intolerance is that if you do a biopsy or you look at the histology, you'll see normal intestinal mucosa. And this is so important, guys. Very, very high yield buzzword because there's so much different GI pathology that they're going to go after on USMLE and Comlex, but lactose intolerance is normal intestinal mucosa. So if you see this, it helps you rule in or rule out certain things that should be on your differential when you're answering these questions. But guys, that's it. That's galactose metabolism. That's the diseases of galactose metabolism. Know the pathway, know the enzymes, and know the symptoms, especially of the galactokinase deficiency and classic galactosemia. If you know what I've talked about in this video, you'll definitely get all of your questions right on test day.